Hello, lovelies. It is early on Friday. Well, early for our live streams. Usually we do them in the afternoon. Hopefully the light from the window doesn't disturb you too much. <laughs> so I am here for a small period of time to bother you. Have some tea. We're going to talk about shoulder rests really briefly. And then I wanted to just continue talking about um, the small little bit that I am learning about the Baroque time period. This week I'm showing um, my students the four seasons. So we're looking at winter because we are currently in winter. We were also looking at spring. And there's actually, there's so much that we're going to talk about. But as always, we must have some tea, although I'm letting this brew. Maybe I should let this brew a little bit. I'm gonna let this brew. So um, let's just touch base really quickly on some shoulder rest stuff, okay? So I'm gonna use my violin, although my violin and my viola have the same setup. For those of you out there who are confused about shoulder rests, I do wanna show you probably the most popular shoulder rest is called a coon. This is the Kuhn original. There are other Kuhns that have like collapsible legs and I despise those. <laughs> so I always go for the Kuhn original. Each leg is a different size. So let's I take them off. Shoulder rest, shoulder rest surgery moment, okay? I just wanna show you that there are two different sized legs, right? Wow, you guys must all be at work. There's one person, ooh. <laughs> yeah, I know it's an odd time. So right now I'm showing you the fact that your shoulder rest, if you have a coon, has two different size legs, okay? So let's look at this tall one here. Oh yay, there's four of you. Hi, you guys, hello lovelies. We're talking really quickly about shoulder rests um, and then we're going to get into the Baroque. So if you have a coon shoulder rest, take your legs off. <laughs> or leave them on, but I just want you to know that there are two different sizes, okay? All right, so now your shoulder rest has kind of a curved side and then like a lower side, right? This curved side is going to sit on your shoulder because it's shaped to fit your shoulder, right? So um, does that make sense? So this way, if I, would, if I put it on this way, this one's not shaped to fit my shoulder, and this would feel really weird. So you want the this part, this like concave part to wrap around your shoulder or just sit on your shoulder, right? Okay, so the longer leg, you can take this longer leg and put it on the part that's on your chest. And that's because the part that's under your jaw is not as tall as the part that's here. So you're gonna need a little extra height for the leg that's kind of on your chest rather than the one that's under your chin. That one you don't need like a crazy amount of height for, so that's why that one's a bit shorter. So I'm going to just pop this longer leg on the side that's on my chest. And just for, you know, adjustment's sake, I'm gonna keep it kind of tall, all right? And then the shorter leg is going to go on the side that's underneath my jaw, okay? So pop this on. There are also, there's lots of different shoulder rests out there, but my favorite one is the this one, which is the Kuhn Original. Um, I've gone through several different kinds of shoulder rests. I think I'm doing this wrong. Hold on, blonde moment. Okay, I got this. Okay, just hold on. I think I just have to put it in the right way. Let's see. <laughs> anyway. So you're gonna just pop this in. And because it's under your jaw, let's say you have just like a, if you have just a normal size neck, if you have a really tall neck, maybe you can keep it on the tall side, but I'm going to kind of wind this down just until it's maybe like there-ish. You see that? Okay. Oh my gosh, there's 10 of you, thank you. I hope you're all having a good day. <laughs> So we're just talking shoulder rest stuff really quickly. All right, so I've left the side that's under my, on my chest nice and tall, just so that we can kind of tweak it. And you know what, I will take my little um, scarf off so that you can see what chin rest I have. One of my most popular videos is actually all about chin rest and shoulder rest and it's so old and like cringy. 
So, um, but it has like all these, you know, it's apparently a helpful video. So this is a Whitner, Whitner hypoallergenic side mount as opposed to center mount. It's a side mounted chin rest. Okay, they make it for violin and viola and they make it in all these different sizes. So if you have a little one that's playing the violin, you can get it in various sizes. But I like this one because it sits somewhat over the tailpiece, but it's on the side as well. So I just like the way that that sits, all right? Some people can get away with not having to play with a shoulder rest. I am not one of those people. I need a shoulder rest. So now when you put it on, oops, just bear with me. <laughs> We are going to talk about the Vivaldi, I promise, and we'll have some tea. I did just wanna give you this information for anyone out there that's confused about it because I have been getting a lot of questions. So you can put your chin, your shoulder rest on horizontal like this. You could put it on kind of more at an angle like this. You could put it more at an angle like this. Everyone's body is a little bit different. So for me, see how this little leg is like one finger away from this? That's where mine kind of likes to sit and then it just goes right across. Um, you can also experiment with these little things, making it wider or smaller. So you can see I've got one extra little one on that one and one little extra one on that one. So that's where mine is, okay? So let's see how that sits. All right, so I've put it across like this. Okay, let's see how that fits. So actually, that fits pretty well. <laughs> Gosh, that light is very frustrating. Okay, can you see me okay? I hope this is all right. I forgot to um, get an extra light. Sometimes I put a light behind you guys so that I'm a little bit more lit. So then the instrument's kind of sitting as if my hands were in front. It's not all the way over here that I'm sitting like this, it's sitting kind of in front of me and I can just look and see what I'm doing. My nose is kind of in line with the scroll, you see, as opposed to this or this or this. Everyone's a little bit different, but it does kind of help to have like this alignment going, you know, and keeping the instrument up as opposed to down like this. It's just, you know, you can play the violin however you want to play it. I'm just giving you some tips that have, um, that seem to help everybody. So when you have your instrument up, you see how my arms are in front of me? They're not over this way like this. Imagine that you had your arms out for an hour, right? Put them, you just, if you're at work, <laughs> let's do this. Put your arms in front of you like this, okay? Now turn your left hand over, okay? And then now let's just kind of let your elbows go like this and then just put them right in front of you, right? This is kind of the, the uh, angle for your instrument to sit in almost in front of you, okay? So now imagine that you had your arms at a diagonal out to the side and forward like this. Now hold that for an hour. Would you rather do that or would you rather do this? <laughs> so just noticing which one causes more strain on your body and which one is a little bit more comfortable on your body, right? And now try leaning forward as opposed to standing up straight, which one is a little bit more comfortable, right? So that's kind of how you want your instrument to sit. You want your arms pretty well in front of you and you don't wanna be playing like this or like this, right? So everyone has a little bit different setup. And then on additionally, I like to sometimes, um, I don't know, I need a little extra padding here. So sometimes I want, I'll use like a really big, um, like bandana, you know, like a gigantic bandana as opposed to like a little men's pocket scarf. This is like a, I got this in Italy when I was there. This is like a little pocket scarf, right? So just, I just fold it in half and then I lay it like this on the instrument. This is my chin rest down here. I just have a little bit. Put a rubber band around it and then take this and flop it over like that and that just kind of keeps it secured like that so that's just that's that's all i have to say about shoulder rest and chin rest and all of that and um 
I'm noticing that nobody is saying anything. <laughs> I wonder if I have, I'm actually very confused by YouTube at the moment. I don't know um, why. I Some lovely person out there said that I um, didn't have it set on something, like I had turned off the chat, but I just don't know what I'm doing. I'm not meaning to turn off the chat. If there's no chat, I did not mean to silence you because I like saying hi and seeing your comments. So I've probably, let me see if there's something I can do with that here. Um, hmm, I have no clue. Ooh, what's this? <laughs> oh, I can put like a, I can put a, um, like a filter. Let's do a scary one. There we go. Oh, that's like dancey. Okay, I'm gonna go back to normal. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, you guys. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry if our um, chat is not working. It doesn't seem to be working. I'm sending you all love, my love and hugs, and I know you're sending them back to me, too. <laughs> so, okay, that's those are my thoughts on shoulder wrists and chin wrists. I use a Kuhn Original, not collapsible, a Kuhn Original shoulder rest, and I use the Whitner Hypoallergenic Side Mount Chin Rest, okay? So I use that on both my violin and viola. All right, so I think my tea has brewed and we can discuss some fabulous Baroque things. We're gonna maybe look a little bit at Vivaldi's Four Seasons. So, you know, today I'm taking my studio, whoever wants to go to the art museum. We're gonna go look at some medieval Renaissance and Baroque art. And I'm so excited, every once in a while I like to take little field trips <laughs> to um, concerts or whatnot. This is the first time we've been to the museum, so I'm excited. It's gonna be really cold today. So it's gonna be like 30 something today, so that's quite cold. It's gonna feel like winter finally. Okay, so let me think for a minute um, about where to start. Um, let's actually, I'm gonna, after this is over, I'm going to link a couple things so that you can also review this on your own. You know I love the website Violin Online, so why don't, if you have a computer, just pull, pull up, Google Violin Online Vivaldi's Four Seasons, and that'll bring you to a page that actually has PDF links to all four of them, just like little tiny, they're kind of abridged versions. They're written in an easier key for more beginner players. I love Violin Online. <laughs> they are just so great. So we're gonna be looking at Winter Today from Vivaldi's Four Seasons, and I'm using the one on Violin Online. It's the Largo from Winter. So again, just Google Violin Online, Vivaldi's Four Seasons. It'll take you to a page and you can pull that up if you'd like, and I'll also link it below after this. And then at the same time, you can also Google, let's see, Go ahead and Google um, Baroque ornamentation, because we're going to really briefly just talk about ornamentation. I know like this much about Baroque ornamentation, so we're going to just, I'll give you, I'll just plant the seed in your brain and then you can go <laughs> um, find someone more like educated about Baroque ornamentation. So I'm looking at Wikipedia's link on ornamentation for the Baroque time period, that's one other thing. And then the other thing, let's see, there's two other things. The third thing that you could Google is the Four Season Sonnets. Did you know that there's poetry that goes along with the Four Seasons? So this is like so awesome. I, re I feel like there's a little muse that like whispers in my ear, like these wonderful ideas because we've been talking about poetry for so long. I've been starting lessons with a poem, although I've kind of stopped doing, although we're using this poem, so we're still, <laughs> we're still on poetry, but we're, we've been using poems to help us with our expression. And it's something that we do so innately when we talk. Um, but when we play music, sometimes we, we just like, are just trying to make something sound nice and we, we forget what the vibe is. Like if you're reading, let's say, if you're Googling Vivaldi's Four Seasons, the sonnets, the, the poems, the sonnets to Vivaldi's Four Seasons, I'm looking at Wikipedia's um, page on that. It has an Italian and then it has an English translation right next to it. 
So like if you were to read the spring sonnet, the first movement, this is what I mean by getting the right vibe when you're playing. Let's say I read it like this. Springtime is upon us. The birds celebrate her return with festive song. You know, it's just the complete wrong vibe. So sometimes we might be playing in a way that's just not the right interpretation and we just we have to remember what the what the point of the song is so it's nice to use poetry to help us with that so the last thing I want us to look at is um, go ahead and just Google Vivaldi's Four Seasons and then type right next to it I M S L P okay so you will probably find a website with Vivaldi's Four Seasons. I probably need to do that too. I thought I had it pulled up. Jazz, give me a moment. I have, I'm one of those teachers that has like three million tabs up all the time. So my little ones always like to laugh at me because I'm like, why is my, why is my uh, iPad so slow? <laughs> okay, well, here, is it here? Nope, that's not it. Okay, well, I'm going to Google it too. This is, this is good stuff, right? I know you guys are like so excited to hear all this stuff that I'm babbling about. Um, just hold on a minute. So Vivaldi, Four Seasons. And we're going to type in IMSLP, okay. There we go, I'm gonna click on that link there. And then I'm going to click on there's actually, under the sheet music tab, there's four different concertos. We're going to do the winter one. I'm gonna click on that one. And then I'm gonna scroll down, past the recordings to the sheet music. And there's a few different editions. Let's see. I think I'll take the third edition. Oh wait, no, 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 sorry. Sheet music, click on the parts tab. And then let's scroll down to the, let's do the third one, click on the violin solo, and then we're gonna skip the first movement and we're gonna look at the second movement, if I can find it. Where are you? Okay, all right. So now all the tabs are up. <laughs> Let's have a sip of tea, that was difficult, that was so hard. Are you guys doing all right? You know what I've been thinking about now that we've got these tabs up, or at least I have my tabs up, I have been thinking there, it's so interesting reading about the Baroque time period. It's all about emotions and they think, believing that it was really, really healthy for us as humans to be able to express our emotions and that music and art could be a way for us to experience and go through the, that emotion. So I don't know if you've ever like had one of those moments where you're scrolling through YouTube and like one of your favorite YouTubers, they like, they like have a, a bad day and it, and you're like having a bad day too. And you just listen to them complain about their bad day and like everything. And it's like, it just like, it's nice to hear them. You don't want them to have a bad day, but it's nice to hear them like express that because maybe it's in a way it's something that you resonate with, maybe you might be feeling the same way and it helps you to get through that feeling. So, so um, or it can be just nice, you know, if you have a favorite YouTuber, I love um, learning to be fearless. I, I followed her for years and years and years and I've watched her like go into this beautiful relationship and I just love seeing her and her like other half. And it just makes me so happy to feel that and um, anyway, I don't know if you've noticed that, but us as humans, we actually really need to be able to feel our emotions and being able to experience them through art or through music or poetry or talking to a friend or whatever it is through literature, it just really helps us to like get through those emotions too. So um, that's what I've been thinking about this week. <laughs> The other thing is um, that one of the one of the ways that we can really understand our emotions and also looking at this Baroque time period is by noticing the contrasts. So if this makes any sense, in the Baroque art that I've looked at, there's this element of contrast that's really, really prevalent. So 
there's, um, if you were to Google the Last Supper, just type in Baroque Last Supper. One of the, I'm sure there's like, you know, millions of different Baroque Last Suppers, but there's one that's mostly dark, it's mostly black. And then there's this like beacon of light that's piercing the darkness in the corner. And it's so dramatic, the contrast of the dark and the light. And um, sometimes we really need to experience the contrast emotion for us to really understand what is going on. So um, that's why I sometimes say like, you really need to feel your emotions. And even, I don't know if I've said this before, but I'm sure you've heard it before. Sometimes we just really need to get out of our comfort zone. And sometimes that can help us get out of like our little, you know, bubble that's like this big. And we can kind of experience a little bit more of the whole picture rather than just being like zoned into this one like little dot of the picture. If that makes any sense, I might not be making any sense, but okay, let's go ahead. <laughs> let's go back to violin online. Okay. So let me find, we'll scroll through those millions of tabs again. And we're going to click on winter, the violin online version of that. All right. So let's see if you guys remember anything from our music theory, you know, talks. Does anyone remember the order of the sharps? right? The order of the sharps. Remember my acronym? Father Charlie goes down and eats breakfast. So when you see two sharps, it's Father Charlie. It's F and C sharp, right? So if we're looking at the key signature of this one, the original version is in E flat. There's three flats in that one, but this one is the kind of easier simplified version, D major. So to figure out, I know it's D major because I can look at it, it starts on a D, it ends on a D. If I was to play it, it would sound joyful, right? Um, but I can also tell that by this, the last sharp. So if you find the last sharp, Father Charlie, so C sharp, find the note right after that in the alphabet. What comes after C or C sharp in the alphabet? A, D, D, D. So it, that's the key. So you're just taking the last sharp of however many sharps you have, Take the last sharp, find the note right after that, that gives you the key. At least that gives you the major version. There is a contrasting minor version that has the same key signature, which is interesting. Um, sometimes composers actually use that contrast of the same key. One section will be in the major and then the other section will be in the minor. It's the same key signature, but they feel completely different, which is interesting. So, okay, I'm going to play you a little bit of winter here and then we will look at it together. We can talk about ornamentation and some of the things that are going on with this, okay? All right, here's my violin today, okay? I feel like you're kind of, need to move you back a little bit. Can you see that a little bit better? Hold on. Uno momento. By the way, you guys should follow me on Instagram. Um, I have been trying to post a story every day. So just kind of like the glimpse inside the life of a music teacher, I'm just kind of showing you some little things um, that I like to do in my daily life. And, you know, if you're interested, it's just violin, viola, master class. So, all right. Oh, you know, before we play this, I need, I, we need to look at the poem. Okay, so let's actually go back and look at the Vivaldi sonnets. And since we're doing winter Largo, I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom and I'm gonna read you this translation, right? Because it's originally in Italian. <laughs> so we're doing the second movement, which is the Largo. Before the fire to pass peaceful contented days while the rain outside pours down, right? So I really feel like this is talking about like the vibe of this is very cozy. You're sitting around the fireplace. If you're in Italy, you're probably with your family and friends right around the fireplace. Hopefully if you're anywhere in the world <laughs> and you're in winter and you're sitting by a fire, you're surrounded by your loved ones and you're just a peaceful, contented, and it's just kind of pouring rain outside. So it's just, just a cozy vibe, right? So let's see if the piece reflects that coziness. Okay, and see if you can kind of hear that rain outside. Maybe that's kind of part of it too. All right, so just one more time. This is the abridged version. 
of um, Winter Largo on Violin Online, okay? Maybe I can move you a little closer so those of you who are interested can watch my left hand, okay? Okay, wow, thank you so much for the thumbs up. I really appreciate that. <laughs> okay. All right, so. the vibe of it does it sound cozy to you does it kind of feel like it's a cozy little time together now if you were I've been telling everybody if you were sitting around the fireplace with your family would you be and you were all cozy would the vibe be right not really so um, when you're playing through it, yeah, and we have to kind of get the notes, you could practice it. Just trying to get the notes and everything. But at the end of the day, it's this that's expressing the, the feel. So if it's nice and cozy and gentle, be nice and cozy and gentle with your bow if you can. Right, listen to the beginning of each bow stroke if it's hard or if it's kind of soft and rounded. Right, so it's just nice and cozy sounding. All right, so that's the vibe. Um, it might change throughout it. We can look at that kind of further on, but one of the things I want to point out to you is actually this fabulous use of contrast um, that Vivaldi is using. So, in music, we have musical sentences, just like we have sentences in like, you know, real life. <laughs> when you're reading something or when you say something, you have a sentence, right? You're saying something, you're trying to communicate an idea, right? And then there is a conclusion to the idea. You can say another sentence and then build upon that. Music is just like that too. So I'm gonna play you kind of what I think of as the first full musical sentence. See if you can kind of hear, sometimes we're going down and there is a sequence where we're going up, but we're going down as we're going up. It's kind of an interesting um, thing that he's doing. So remember it's raining outside, so maybe it's kind of conveying that kind of gentle rain. So here's our first kind of musical sentence. does kind of feel like it keeps on going but let's just call that our first little idea right did you notice at the beginning um, we've got that little descending it goes up but then it rapidly comes down gently does it again it goes up and then it comes down and then here there's this interesting use of ascending while descending 
So here's stair one. We went up and then we went down. Going up. And going down. And when we're kind of gently going down here, I want you to notice if it's a gentle descent or is it like a really plop, <laughs> hard landing at the end. Think like, let me actually play it like if it was a hard ending, just so that you can hear how funny that sounds. So. crazy to play it that way, right? It's just getting heavier and more pedantic and then it's there. <laughs> but I don't think that's the interpretation, right? So we kind of have to look at the harmony, what the harmony is trying to communicate through feeling, right? Through emotions. Um, and maybe even like the structure, like what's going on when you can kind of notice those little musical sequences where it's kind of like that same little pattern but it's slightly changed right or it's kind of progressing somewhere either going downwards or upwards and then just noticing you know is it what's the feel is it gentle descent or is it like a really strong descent <laughs> right so all of those are are different ways that you as an artist can kind of approach it but it's just interesting that it there is this contrast of going upwards while going downwards at the same time right and actually the second half which starts kind of in measure 17. It's very similar to the beginning, right? The very beginning, it starts on a D. The second half starts on an A. Let's actually think about where A is in relation to D, because we're in the key of D major. So D, E, F sharp, G, A. So A is our fifth scale degree, and that's really typical to kind of switch into the fifth um, chord, right? So one and five are very important chords in music. So we're shifting over into kind of A major here, and you're gonna start to see some G sharps as well. So when you're switching into the five chord, you're actually creating um, a lot of dissonance against your one chord, so it feels very tense. If you think about it, the notes of A major, for example, are A, C sharp, E. Remember C sharp and E, okay? The D chord has D, F sharp, A. So remember we had C sharp and E? C sharp next to D, is it's a half step. It sounds very, very dissonant. And then you have E next to D, which is A whole step away. It's also dissonant. Um, so you've got a lot of dissonances against your one chord, and that's just kind of the function of a five chord. It, it's like really supposed to create tension, right? So um, anyway, at the end, we do have that kind of, and the second half, what I mean, is um, in measure 17. Listen to this. but it's not going down this time it's actually going up which is interesting it's contrasting the beginning the beginning was right but the second half does this of doing the opposite which is interesting so I just wanted to point out those things this is one of the ways that you can analyze a piece of music that helps you understand more about it just like if you were trying to read a poem you would need to know what the poem is about let's say you were reading a poem in a different language you could say the words but you had no clue what it was about right and you didn't know one sentence might be you know completely contrasting another sentence for example so making sure that you're communicating it right or at least in an interesting way so let's say, um, well, anyway, I'll let you kind of think about that. That's kind of clear, I think. Um, okay, so let's briefly talk about ornamentation. All right, so 
um, ornamentation. I'm going to click on the Wikipedia link and I need a sip of tea. <laughs> so we're going to have some tea. I'm having some Scottish breakfast tea with a little half and half. It's one of my favorites. Okay, so actually Baroque ornamentation I think is quite um, fabulous. Like I think it's something that you should definitely go learn more about. Um, I think Rachel Barton Pine has an amazing uh, video on like Baroque interpretation or like Bach, Bach's um, sonatas and partitas. Just Google Ra Rachel Barton Pine. I love her. And she, I th she does talk all about ornamentation and it's very, very interesting. So basically, I just wanted you to know, I'm looking at the Wikipedia page that um, let's see, do, do, do. An, ornamenta an ornamentation, if you're curious, think of like a grace note, a trill, um, let's see what else are they kind of saying, like turns, um, so for example, a trill, if you're not sure, is like this, um, a grace note, for example, might be like this, the main note is this one, but the grace note is the one before it, or the one like could be below it. It's just right before the most important note. And then a turn is, it's actually often it looks like a little infinity sign. So it's like a little sideways S over the note. It's your note, above, back, below, and then you end on that note. You see that a lot in fiddle music. All right, so, and to know where your fingers go, you just need to know what key you're in. So let's say I was, um, I had a D natural, a C sharp, let's say I'm in D. So I have a C sharp, a D, a B, an A. And I had a turn on my C sharp, I would do this. But if I had a D sharp in the key signature, then it would be like this. So your fingers just go where they need to given the key signature, but it's always the note above, back, below, and back again. So it kind of creates that little um, infinity sideways S look, shape at least. Okay, so those are, those are ornamentations, but I wanted you to just kind of know that often it's, it, at least according to this, and it's something that I've kind of, does sound familiar <laughs> from my musical studies, that the second time something comes around, that's when you would kind of ornament something Baroque. So um, let's see if I can find where it says that. Do, 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 do. Hmm, let's see. I did see it in here somewhere. Okay, a singer performing a da capo aria, for instance, would sing the melody relatively unornamented the first time and then decorate it with additional flourishes and trills the second time. Similarly, a, harp a harpsichord player performing a simple melodic line was expected to be able to improvise harmonically and stylistically appropriating trills. Uh, oh no, and stylistically appropriate trills, mordants, and arpeggiaturas. So those are like very interesting. You can go listen to Rachel Barton Pine talk about all of those things. But let's go back to the um, Vivaldi, the violin online version. And I'm going to show you some examples of ornamentation, at least my small understanding <laughs> of things that you could do um, for the second half. So let me play through the whole thing again and I'll tell you when I get to the second half and see if you can kind of hear what it is that I'm doing. Okay, so here we are at the beginning. Nothing is going to be um, changed. I'm just playing exactly what is here on the page on Violin Online.
for a cadence. So here's the second half. kind of adding notes kind of around it using scales or above or below. making up stuff there. Or something. So there's all these different ways that you can kind of, kind of add to the main notes. I'm just kind of using scales. Um, I mean, taking advantage of moments where I have a big gap maybe, to fill that in. So for example, at the beginning of the second half of measure 17, instead of doing, I'm filling it in. And then just adding some little things. And for that, um, I'm going from a B to an E there. Um, I'm kind of an A major and I'm adding a G sharp to my descent because of that. If I added a G natural, it would sound kind of weird. Right, it doesn't, right, it doesn't work right. So your ear would kind of catch you on that, which is kind of interesting. So I'm adding a G sharp because it's an E chord there, an E major chord. Um, which would have a G sharp in there. And I, I, there's nothing that's marked there. I'm just given the notes that are there and the fact that we're kind of switching into A. Um, a has a G sharp in there and there's some G sharps that are floating around and your ear will kind of catch things like that. So anyway, it's kind of a fun time to practice adding your own little twist on things. And I think the more that you look into ornamentation, like Baroque style ornamentation, the more like like exciting it will be to play Baroque music because there's a lot of room for artistic interpretation. Like so much room for artistic interpretation. I think, um, you know, when we're, there's like a certain, it's my understanding that there's a certain time period when composers really exactly, specifically wrote exactly everything that they wanted um, on the page. Right, and that's very true in specific, in like certain orchestra pieces for sure. But then there's like other time periods and I think that the Renaissance, the medieval time period and maybe the Baroque time period um, are actually times where musicians were already expected to know a lot of the ways to ornament things and to um, beautify the music in an improvisatory style. Um, so like, just because there's nothing there, like just because there's like no trill there and just because there's no like, you know, grace note there doesn't mean that you can't do one. At least that's my understanding. So um, feel free to, I mean, there was nothing there that was written for me to, to think, oh, I can do a little scale there. Or I can do a grace note or I can do a trill or I could do a turn or whatever. It's just my, it was just what I felt like doing. So I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> Um, let me see if there's anything I can kind of leave you with. Um, something that would be interesting, and I did kind of just touch on it earlier, because we're studying this time period, oh, definitely follow me on Instagram. Please follow me on Instagram. It's Violin Viola Masterclass. I post a story almost every day during the week of um, some of my, like, what I do during the week as a music teacher, things I think are important in life as far as like little routines to have and food and 
what to wear as a music teacher and just uh, going to the gym, <laughs> like some beauty tips, like whatever. Um, showing my, what I do during the week as a music teacher, studio things, all of that is all on violin, viola masterclass. Um, but I want you to experiment with just like noticing how contrast is so important in our lives. Like it's really important for us to to um, appreciate those moments of contrast because it helps us to understand much, much more. And in Baroque music, they use contrast like so much, um, whether it's starting in a major key and then switching to the minor, for example, or like Vivaldi's doing here using a descending line while, you know, and juxtaposing it against a ascending line or ascending while descending or, um, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> Yeah, those are the two, in this one at least. So I think I'm gonna love and leave you with that. I also have a Patreon. Um, I am really interested in the doing, or like creating a little um, like violin circle. I was watching one of my favorite harp teachers yesterday, cause I'm gonna learn how to play the harp. It's coming in February and I will show you it. I'm so excited. Um, I just, you know, commissioned a beautiful harp and I like, I just can't even wait. I'm so excited for that. So um, I've been watching these tutorials and she mentioned that she has a Patreon account where she does a harp circle, like every once in a while. I don't know if it's weekly or once a month or whatever it is. Um, but she was saying that, you know, it's nice to be able to get together for anyone that's out there that's learning the harp or the violin, you know, um, to get together in a group and like play for each other or like have a kind of group lesson. So I was thinking that it might be really awesome for me to figure out how to give that for to you guys so that we can kind of have a virtual violin or viola circle where I can either teach a little mini lesson. And I was just thinking of taking you through some technique books because I know that a lot of you guys are probably learning, maybe you're learning on your own at least that's the impression that I'm getting from a lot of the comments. So I think it might be helpful to to actually have a teacher kind of guide you stepwise through some basic technique books so that you're kind of learning progressively. Um, but I, I'm not quite, I'm like still kind of dabbling on how to do that. Um, currently on Patreon, I just upload a little mini lesson each week. It's like five to 10 minutes. I know it's not maybe the most interesting right now for people, but it's stuff that you have to know. <laughs> Learning your intervals, there's only so many intervals, so we're going through all of the intervals. We've gone through all of the modes. I'm gonna give you, I already have them recorded, some like little, um, my little hand pattern warm-ups that are so helpful to just kind of know how you're putting your fingers down, helping you apply the intervals that we learned in that little series. And um, so yeah, I just, I'm not quite sure. It's only a dollar for that, but I, I do like the idea of meeting like somehow, like once a month or twice a month to figure out how to do that little violin or viola little gathering to um, go through something, either learn like a song um, or to learn some, some technique. So, or to just have people, you know, play something and then just get some feedback and just say like, I'm really struggling with this and then perhaps I can help you <laughs> in some way, I don't know. Um, I just wanna know how the, I can help you guys um, more, if it's possible. So that is all. My mom is going to come out and visit me uh, on Sunday for a week, and then I'm turning 30 at the end of the month. I'm going away on vacation, I'm going to go sit in a hot spring by a volcano, <laughs> and um, I'm very excited. So you might have some recorded videos for um, the next couple weeks unless I, you know, I managed to get my mom on here with us, but um, my mom is like so shy, but she like pretends to not be shy. So I'm the same way. Um, anyway, I'm going to love and leave you guys. I hope that you're all having a wonderful week. Please follow me on Instagram. I'm taking everyone to the, I'm taking whoever from my studio to the art museum tonight and we're going to go look at the medieval Baroque art. So um, I will probably be posting some of that on my um, Instagram story. So just go, if you're interested, you can go follow me on that. 
and definitely check out Patreon. It's just patreon.com slash Violin Viola Masterclass. Have a cup of tea and I will see you guys very soon. Lots of love and thank you so much for joining. <laughs> Have a great week.